Welcome to Faith Fellowship. It's exciting to be able to serve the Lord in these days, and we're hoping that maybe next week we're going to be able to resume meeting on site and in person, and hopefully it won't be too long before we'll be able to resume our activities. But we're trying to be careful, and so uh, we're meeting online only today, just as we did last week, but hopefully the uh, first Sunday in February will be back together, will be um, online as well, live streaming as, as we are on site. But uh, during the month of February, uh, we always collect gifts, love offerings for the Cookville Pregnancy Clinic, and uh, we call this uh, effort for the love of a child. And we will be having um, envelopes that have a either pink or a red heart on them that indicates the love offering and all the gifts that are received in the envelopes will go to the clinic and on February the 28th, the last Sunday of the month, Nancy Knowlton, the director of the clinic, uh, will be with us uh, and sharing some of the ministry with our church family and she is a great friend of our church and conducts a valuable ministry and community resource and so Let's pray for February and the special offerings we will receive. I want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving to uh, our regular uh, offerings and also to special events um, and uh, purposes that we, for which we raise funds, uh, including our relocation. And uh, we thank the Lord for all of those gifts that have been given. And we receive gifts not only from our church family, but also from great friends that we have uh, within the state and also uh, around uh, the country. And so we uh, thank the Lord for the opportunity to, to raise funds and to relocate in the next few weeks. And we have $25,643.32 raised for relocation. And this is after we recalibrated at uh, $372,000. Uh, and some odd dollars and that was after uh, recalibrating from the land purchase which was uh, over $120,000 and so uh, a lot of money has been raised and God bless you for giving uh, whether you're a part of our church or a friend of our church the Lord has supplied all of our needs and we are so thankful that he, has, that he has done so. And God will continue to meet our needs even in a time of great consternation, uh, such as the time in which we live today, where none of us know what the outcomes will be in our towns, our states, our nation, and in our world. And so God always provides for us. We're going to uh, repeat together the words of the great Apostle Paul. And from wherever you are, will you repeat with me these words? And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And so we thank God for that uh, wonderful promise. Today we're going to be taking a text from Ephesians chapter 4. We're reading verses 1 through 16. And this is the fourth installment of our uh, uh, sermon series this is how we do it. As we are starting a new year, the first week we talked about the value of the ministry. The second week in the series we talked about the role of the pastor, the overseer or the bishop. And last week we talked about the role of deacons uh, in the church. And one of the things we looked at was the uh, first Christian martyr, Stephen, that gave his life uh, for the cause of Christ. And the scripture said he was a deacon, one of the original seven, and he was full of the Holy, of the Holy Ghost, and God used him mightily. And the picture that we have on the screen is of uh, the basement area. They just put the lights in, and uh, this last week, and the lights are LEDs, and it's a little hard to get it on this screen, but I'm just telling you, it is bright in there. And we have two fellas there, Junior Stamps, who is a deacon, and he's on the right, as you look at the picture, on the left is uh, Jackie 
uh, Loftus and Jackie is a trustee, and as you can see, they are leaning on the brooms. <laughs> so, they, they did a lot of work one day, actually, and I appreciate them doing some cleanup work in the basement, and we thank God for the opportunity that we have to, uh, we locate our ministry not too far from where I'm standing right now, as a matter of fact, probably about half a mile. Uh, we're going to read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Paul said, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, over and through all, and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who ascended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every aspect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and build itself, builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We have observed the role of pastor and deacon in the church and we've talked about the value of the ministry of the church of Christ and the greatest cause in the universe and we're going to be looking now at the equipping of the church the equipping of the church to the ministry of Christ a couple of things I want us to notice from the lengthy passage and there could be many more things but we're going to take a couple of ideas and the first is that Christians are to live worthy of their callings. A great many people who profess to be Christians are not actually Christians at all. I am not saying that simply to be negative. I am not trying to cast dispersions on any person. And I am certainly not trying to be critical of any Christian ministry and the converts uh, that it is able to make for the Lord Jesus Christ. I do not know the hearts of people. And so there is a sense in which neither I nor anyone else knows really who is saved. But uh, there are a great many people today that they sort of rest their salvation in the fact that they said a formula prayer at one time, and I'm not against formula prayers. I use them myself. Uh, there is a certain way that people should pray and certain ideas that should be in the mind when they accept Christ. But there are a great many people that they rest their entire salvation in the fact that they one time said a formula prayer and everything's sealed and there are going to be no problems from then on and uh, I'm not sure that that's enough. Because we've got to do more when we accept Christ and simply say words. I remember I uh, have talked uh, talk to a particular guy a few years ago. I've talked to many people over time uh, that said something like he did. And I mentioned to him uh, one time, I said, are you, uh, you, you are a Christian, uh, are you not? Uh, there was a time that you were saved, and his response to me was, oh, yeah, I did all that. Well, that doesn't sound like a Christian to me. The Bible says without holiness, no person will see God. Jesus said, 
Why do you call me your Lord and Master and don't do the things that I say? And so there's a lot more to being a Christian than just saying, I want in, I want to go to heaven when I die. There has to be a reality behind that. And a great many of the people today that we see that uh, we say are rededicating their lives to the Lord, maybe they're uh, middle age, uh, a little older, maybe in their 20s, uh, they, they're rededicating their lives to the Lord. They say, I accepted Christ some time ago, but I'm rededicating my life to the Lord. The truth is those rededications are first-time salvation decisions because they didn't have a complete understanding of what salvation was all about at the time. A child can be saved. Childlike faith is the only way, as a matter of fact, a person can be saved. And yet, that faith needs to have the element of a certain understanding of truth and sincerity for it to be genuine. I accepted Christ when I was seven years old. I did not know when I was seven years old the uh, theological uh, bases of faith and uh, works that I understand now. But what I gave to Christ when I was seven years old was everything that I had at the time. And I have many times since that day, all those years ago, many times I have in my prayer said, Lord, you remember when I gave my life to you and accepted you back when I was just a child? I want you to know that I still believe those things and I still accept those things and I still want to live for you. There are many people that have gone through some kind of formula prayer that have taken some type of training that are not genuine believers at all. The scripture says that the Gate is wide, the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow the way that leads to life, and few there be which find it. The scripture says that people who are Christians, those who are genuinely real Christians, are those who live worthy of their calling. And so Paul said to the Ephesians, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. Well, in what ways is a Christian to live worthy of the calling? And there are many, many things that could be added. Let me just mention two. Number one, a Christian, one who is genuinely saved, should live worthy of salvation. We are not saved because we say to God at some time, I want in, I want to go to heaven. Now that's good and that's part of it, but that's not all of it. Salvation costs something. And there is a danger of cheap grace that can be taught if we're not careful. And cheap grace can be believed, but it cannot save. Because your salvation and my salvation cost something. It cost Jesus his life. He died to, to buy our pardon. And if you're a good Christian, it's going to cost you something. So you need to live worthy of your calling. You call, you're called to be a child of God? Then live a life that indicates you recognize the value of your salvation. But then a Christian must live a life worthy of their calling 
not only in salvation, but their calling to representation. And some of those things are mentioned by Paul when he said, live a life that's worthy of your calling. So could you expound on that, Paul? And he said, okay, uh, here are some examples. Be completely humble and gentle. Be humble and gentle. Any one of those has been hard to do, but doing both of them is difficult. When I was in high school, I ran on the track team. My coach at the time was uh, Willie Stevens. Willie Stevens was one of the premier athletes ever to come out of the area. He's in the Tennessee State Athletic Association Hall of Fame. He's one of the best hurdlers in the country in his day. And Willie Stevens was such a gentle man. And when I knew it, that's what I needed. Was someone who would teach me in a gentle way. Paul said, if you're going to represent Christ, be completely humble and gentle. And then he said, be patient, bearing with one another in love. In other words, be lovingly patient. Patience is a virtue. Patience is hard to come by. And patience is valuable. You're going to have to learn to bear with other people because other people are not going to always reach the standard that they need to reach. You have to remember that you don't either, nor do I. And so we need to be patient in a loving manner with one another. How else do we represent the Christian cause in Christ? Well, well, we are united in peace. And Paul goes into explanation on this point. And this is what he said. There is one body. What he meant by that is there's one church. Now, when he said there was one church, he was talking about the unity of all believers regardless of what we consider affiliation today in the body of Christ, the worldwide church. There's only one church. Now, we identify in our local churches, our local assemblies, and that's good because there are many things that can only be done through the local assembly, but you have to remember there's only one true church of God. He not only said that, he said there's only one spirit. And then he said there's only one hope. There's only one Lord, he said. He said there's only one faith. By the way, there are a lot of people today that they think faith uh, saves a person and it doesn't really matter what that faith is. All faith is valid. All faith is not valid. Not in a salvatory sense. There's only one faith. And there's only one baptism. There's only one God. There's only one Father. And that Father is the Father of all, the Father over all, the Father in all, and the Father through all. In other words, God is to permeate every aspect of my life and yours. And there are some people that will say things like, well, that I, I am a believer, I am a person of faith, but that's a private matter. And I am not judging whether or not those people have genuine faith, but I do want to tell you that was not the position of the New Testament Christians. It was no secret what they believed. And it cost them to follow Christ. And so Paul said, want to know how to represent Christ? To walk worthy of your calling, be humble and gentle, be lovingly patient, be united in peace 
and the oneness of believers in the cause of Christ. And then he pointed out that in all of this unity, there are differing occupations. And he gives a uh, rather mysterious and worthy of study little uh, insight into the way that God gave gifts. And basically what he was saying was that Christ conquered death, ascended on high, and left gifts behind for his followers. And there are a lot of other ways that you could, or things that you can add into that short, brief explanation. But that's that's basically what it is. Uh, Christ, Christ died, conquered death, ascended on high, and he left something for his believers, and those were his gifts. And so the second thing we look at in the passage is that all Christians are to work, walk worthy of their callings, but we secondly consider that Christians are gifted by God. Now, the reason these gifts were left by Christ is so that his work could be carried on in the proper manner. Certain officers, or certain offices, should we say, are for the equipping of saints. And, and this is what Paul says they were. He says there were apostles and prophets. Now, I don't have anything against a person if they want to call themselves an apostle today. But strictly speaking, there are no living apostles. Because the apostles, one of the requirements was that they had seen the living, living Christ. And uh, or the risen Christ. And uh, there's nobody alive today that meets that qualification. But there were apostles in that day. Uh, and then there were prophets. And I have nothing against someone calling themselves a prophet. But in, in the strictest sense, the prophetic office has been phased out if we consider it in the terms of the, uh, of the biblical prophets. Now, sometimes people will say a prophet uh, could equate to a preacher. And I, I wouldn't argue with somebody about that, but um, that's a different type of thing. But apostles and prophets, therefore the equipment of the saints. And then evangelists. Now, having said what I, I did a little bit ago uh, regarding a lot of believers that have gone through the formula of prayers not really being saints at all, everyone who knows me very well knows that I'm in favor of aggressive evangelism. And I try to witness, I encourage other people to witness I witness people cold turkey just like I witness the friends that I've, I've known for years. And uh, I'll try to get people to accept Christ. And, and I, I believe in that. Uh, but I'm not deceived by uh, the weaknesses of those who, uh, who, who are, don't really have saving faith or the imperfections in presentations. But there are some people that are particularly gifted by God in evangelism. They just know how to talk to people. And I've worked with a number of people over the years that they had a much better manner of at least opening the door to evangelism with people than myself. And I've done a lot of cold and warm evangelism. But I've seen the giftedness in other people. Some people particularly gifted as evangelists. And so therefore the equipping of the church. Um, and then pastors and teachers are mentioned. And I am pretty sure that a great application of the teacher aspect uh, has to do with teaching pastors. It says pastors and teachers. Pretty sure the teachers refers to a large extent to part of what the pastor does. But, but I want to say something beyond that. I think it can also apply to individual teachers as well that serve in the ministry of the church. 
Because the church, the individual church, uses many teachers. There are some people that are able to teach children. They're just, they're just better at it than other people are. There are some people that are better at teaching adults, and some people do well with those in between. And the church uses and needs many teachers. Let me say something about the role of teachers in the church because we talked about pastors and deacons in particular offices. Most churches are going to have pastors, deacons, trustees, and a core of teachers. At root, the church is a volunteer organization. As a volunteer organization, we are bound together by an unenforceable bond. And here's what I mean. If you're the teacher at a school and you don't show up for work, they'll probably think you're sick. And you don't show up for work the next day, they might check on you. But you keep not showing up for work as a teacher at the public school and you're getting fired. That's not the way it works in the church. I don't know of a church in existence that does not have difficulty with its volunteer staff. A pastor told me some years ago, he said, it's not anything for our church to have 12 people not show up for their post on a Sunday morning and not even call or anything. And so you're scrambling at the last minute. Because the church is not an employer as such. It can be in some areas, but it works on a volunteer basis. And if a volunteer is not at their post, you don't fire them. You have to scramble and try to work with them and see what's wrong. But the church ministry cannot be carried on without volunteers. It's just impossible. So what are the teachers supposed to do? Well, I think they have to do the things that are in the text for the church. But let me just give some general ideas. Teachers must unite the church. I've been a pastor for a long time, and I have had the unfortunate uh, opportunity <laughs> to once in a blue moon see a teacher that sort of looked at their class or their group as their own little church, not a part of the larger church. And I, I'm not even against that in a certain way if what you're talking about is they have things that's for their class and they go places with their class. I'm not even against that. But teachers have to remember that they're in charge of a certain area, but that's part of the larger area. It's part of the larger ministry. And so teachers unite the church. Also, teachers have to teach sound doctrine. I think probably one of the reservations I come into when I'm talking to people about teaching some way in the ministry, uh, teachers will often say something like, well, I, I'm not even sure if I can do a very good job because I don't, I don't know, I don't know everything I need to know as a teacher. And I always say something like, I don't know everything I need to know as a pastor. So that can't be your excuse. You do the best that you can. You do the best that you can. But you need to teach sound doctrine. Now, here, here's one thing about this. Every once in a while, somebody will come along and they'll be a popular Bible teacher or maybe on television or they'll be a writer of books and they'll come up with some kind of uh, 
novel way of looking at the scripture that just doesn't seem exactly right. It doesn't seem exactly wrong, but you don't know how. Teachers need to not do that type of thing. I have been able to, over my ministry, my pulpit ministry, to look back over things that I have taught over the years. And I'll, I'll be real honest with you. There's some things that I hit on a little more in days gone by. I wouldn't do it today. And so we need to be committed to sound doctrine. I, I am not against anybody having their opinion. But just remember that your opinion may not necessarily be the uh, sole verity of Scripture. So teachers have to unite the church. They, they must teach sound doctrine, do it the best they can, And they must not be silly gospel vagabonds. Now, I say this not intending for people to say, I used to be a teacher, is he talking about me? That's not, that's, not what I'm that's not what I'm talking about. They must not be people who are who have their head turned by whatever the latest thing is. I say that not trying to say that teachers should not be current. Not that they should not use the best methods available to them and what's working now. There are a number of things that used to work in the church that don't seem to work as well today as they did at one time. They just don't. But I have known a number of people involved in the ministry of the church that whatever the latest fad was, they grabbed onto that right away and then as soon as they had licked all the candy off, they went on to the next thing and you never knew where they were at. They were at. And by that, that's what I mean by saying they're gospel vagabond. There are a lot of preachers like that too, by the way. There has to be a firmness in those who teach. It has to be reliable. And you don't want your pastor, you don't want your deacon, you don't want your church officer. You don't want your teachers. You don't want your volunteer staff in the church to be people that just run from thing to thing to thing and there's not ever any stability. They're just following whatever seems flashy at the time. In the text, Paul mentioned maturity two or three times. And that's what you want to see in those that help conduct the ministry. And by the way, everybody needs to be involved in the ministry some way. Everybody's not going to have a voted on position in the church, but everybody needs to be involved in the ministry in some way and doing something for the cause of Christ. Now, having considered the fact that Christians are gifted by God. Let me say that gifts that people may have and equipping a person's self for the ministry may not be the same thing. I mentioned reservation some people will give when uh, considering whether they should teach. You can extrapolate that out and apply that in a lot of different areas um, where a lot of times people, they can say, I don't feel any particular gift in this area. Sometimes you may sort of be draw, drawing a blank when you think about how am I gifted. Let me encourage you to try stuff. Just try stuff. 
I tried a number of things that I'm not particularly all that good at. One thing I tried is singing. And uh, nobody ever told me I wasn't good at singing. I could tell by the look on their faces. <laughs> but I want to I be used of God in some way. The gifts and equipping are not the same thing. Consider using that point. Consider the talent of singing with regard to training. There's a difference between a person who has a pleasing voice and can carry a tune and somebody who's a trained singer. Okay? Some people are naturals at teaching. Some people can teach, but they have a little more study in it than others. So there may be a difference between somebody being gifted and somebody being equipped. But Christians learn in context, and by that I mean they learn as they go. I'm always picking up little tidbits of how I should do things, and when I come across a useful method, I try to make a, a note of it. So, believer, you've been gifted by God in some way. It may not seem to be a large gift in your eyes, but you have been gifted by God in some way. Take whatever leaning or inclination or leading of God that you have, and try to equip yourself, help yourself become better at that pursuit. Gifts are for the building of the church. Certain offices have been given by God to equip the saints. Gifts and equipping may not be the same thing, and whatever gifts people have are meant to build up the church what do they build the church into? They build the church into unity. Make the church more united. Okay? Secondly, they build the church in maturity. Now, it's going to be hard for you to be very good at any sport if you never got to play. It's going to be hard for you to exercise your gifts in the church if you never get on the field. If you never stick your hand up or say, I'll do it, or I'll give it a go, or I'll give it a try. When you put yourself out there, you make more advancements than you would ordinarily, even if you study from a book or looked at somebody else's example. Um, you begin to serve Christ as a novice and then you grow and mature. Now the gifts that God's given believers in the church, therefore the unity of the church, to keep the church together, but they're also to build the maturity of the church as well as of the individual. Now what did Paul mention in the text that the church need to be mature in? Well, he mentioned the fullness of Christ. We're supposed to be becoming more Christ-like. I'm supposed to be helping the church in my role. Others have their role as well. Secondly, we're supposed to be maturing individually and as a church in sound doctrine. Now, Paul mentioned the fact of not being blown about by every wind of doctrine. For your entire life, there are going to be new ideas coming along that do not have a sound scriptural base. Somebody thought it up, and what applies to teachers applies to individual believers as well. Another aspect of maturity is that when people are mature, they are unable to be fooled. Now, I understand that people can be deceived at any point in life, but a part of getting older, a part of going through and learning about life is reaching a point where you're a little, a bit, little better able to discern truth from falsehood. And so Christians are gifted by God. They're gifted to help equip the church, equip the saints, and they are gifted to build the church in unity 
maturity, and loving truthfulness. Scripture says that we should speak the truth in love. A lot of times when you love, you don't want to speak the truth. And a lot of times when you want to tell somebody the truth, you don't do it in love. And so Paul said, that's part of being mature. That's part of what the church is supposed to be striving for. And so Paul said that Christians are to live worthy of their callings. He said Christians are gifted by God. And then he brought forth the truth that Christians are individual parts in a body. Now, a few things about the body uh, in the physical sense, yours and mine. The body is to grow. One of the things that we're always emphasizing with the church is the number of folks we have are growing in that area. Secondly, we're always mentioning the amount of money we have. Are we growing in that area? I don't know of anything that will harm a church anymore than the money dropping off or the people dropping off. But I want to bring something else to your mind. That is not the only way that churches are to grow. All of these things that Paul has mentioned and some of them that I've brought to your mind, all of those things, not one of them mentions anything financial or anything numerical. It's talking about spiritual growth. The question for us is, are we helping the body grow? In my role or in yours, are we helping the body grow? Something else Paul mentioned about the body. He said the body is to join. Paul mentioned the, uh, the ligaments and uh, I think the King James Version maybe uses the word sinews and, and everything being hooked together in the body. Uh, this last week or the last couple of weeks uh, we picked up one of our cars had a little body work done and I um, was talking to the fellow who did it and I said, I said, you know, um, I thought we just had to replace the bumper, but then found out that the the light needed to be replaced too. And the uh, fellow just smiled and looked at me and said, it's all hooked together. The Bible says the church is a body. When one part hurts, the whole part hurts. There's a little girl in our church that had a tragic accident. She, she's, doing, she's doing well today, but she got, uh, she got uh, bitten several times, ripped up, I would say, by a pit bull. And it was just terrible. And uh, she uh, suffers no lasting effects. Uh, but I went to the hospital to see her. And, uh, and she's a little girl, just, you know, second grade, something like that. And, and she's laying on, the, on, the, uh, uh, on her bed and she has staples in closing up the wounds. And I said to her, I said, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And she said, it's just on the left side. <laughs> well, there's no such thing as the left side hurting and the right side doesn't know it. So the body's to join together. The body is not only to join together, it's to hold together and let me say something now, which is not self-serving, although people uh, may be tempted to think this way. There's nothing wrong with people changing churches. You can't tell people where to go to church. People can be in God's will and change churches. I'm not making that point, but I am making this point. Have you noticed that there's some people that they're changing several, several times every year? Winds of doctrine blowing them about. Not being said. Have you noticed? Let me let me go further than that. Let me say. Have you noticed that there's some people that they never stick with a job very long? I understand that people can have the wrong job and need to change. I understand that. Have you ever noticed that some people never stick with a spouse very long? They just don't stick with anything for any length of time. The body holds together. And the body.
body Paul said is the word are we part of the church's plan all of us part of the body are we helping the body grow are we part of the group are we keeping things together are we part of the plan we are called to live worthy lives we are gifted by God and we are all parts in the body of Christ let's pray Father, thank you for your word and thank you for the opportunity that we have to uh, spend time together and the opportunity we have to worship, Lord, as we live our lives from day to day. Keep us in the center of your will and guide us with your hand. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We're going to share together the prayer of the lifting up of hands if you will join me from wherever you happen to be today. The ironic blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you folks. Thank you for being with us today.